That is where we leave the city for the moment because as soon as you've done that, you've actually started to re-knit the place back into the fabric um, of the surrounding region. And if you want to know the future of the city, look to the regions. Um, it's been wonderful working with Ian James and his partner Jody. I don't know if, I don't know if you're here tonight from Cunderdon who farm, uh, they're export wheat farmers, learning a little bit about their world and about their lives um, as they have run afoul of global biotechnology corporations, people trying to, to sustain our place as a net food exporter, which is one of the most precious things you can imagine in the 21st century, that we've come up with a regional resilience package in a way actually of supporting farmers to stay on the land so that we can feed ourselves in the decades that are to come. Of course, things like ta taking on the supermarket duopoly, renaming competition policy into something else, because it certainly shouldn't be called that, and looking after our farmers so that you get a decent farm gate price for what they produce will all be for nothing if we don't tackle the big one because the wheat belt's dying, partly because of how much we cut down, partly because the rain belt's been pushed more than 100 kilometres to the south. So there are people killing themselves in our wheat belt and walking off farms, towns are dying, even now as the place is drying out. And that's something that we're only seeing the early part of. We can't stop what we've already done, but I think we can stop it getting too much worse to a point where we're simply overwhelmed. So the Energy 2029 project's about grabbing that front and centre. If you remember that diagram I showed you up front, the closed loop economy, the really big one, the one that keeps them all in motion, the energy, what are we going to do about that? So this was a project that we had some wonderful help with from these guys at, at Sustainable Energy Now, um, who formed up, I think, in 2007. Engineers, ex-networks people, people who know about energy, people who know about renewable energy, but also have a foot in the real world. How does the grid work? Um, we can't just fill the place up with wind farms and expect the lights to stay on. So we asked them a deceptively simple question. Could we do our electricity network on 100% renewable energy or not? Because if we can't, I'll stop putting it on bumper stickers. But if we can, <laughs> Where would you put it? What would your technology mix be? What would cost? What are the labour force requirements? So these folk, over the course of, of more than a year, helped us put these scenarios together. And where we landed was the game changer. This technology, solar thermal concentrator plants. So imagine a magnifying glass a mile across that's beaming sunlight up onto the central tower. So these aren't photovoltaics, they're just big mirrors. They're gigantic mirrors that are heating a hot salt solution up to 550 degrees that they then bank in these tanks at the base of the plant and you can then run a plant like this for 16 hours without any sunlight at all. So you're storing up and banking the heat during the day so you can run it flat out through the night. Turn it up, turn it down, they're very responsive, they play very well with wind and photovoltaics and they are a game changer. Plants that you can run on sunlight at midnight, it's a big deal. So that um, previous thing was a computer graphic, this is a real one in the south of Spain, uh, cost more than 400 million euros to build and it's 20 meg. So it's bigger than a pilot plant, but smaller than a utility scale plant. But it works. And I got to visit there in December and stand in the middle of this field of glass, these gigantic heliostats in complete silence, just turning and tracking and following the sun, exactly as the sunflowers in the adjacent field were doing. And it was spooky. <laughs> Such a nerd. I'm sorry. Here's one that's <laughs> six times Six times larger. This is the real deal. This is in the high plains of Nevada. They're commissioning this one in December. It's six times larger, but only costs twice as much to build. Because as you can imagine, as the technology matures, it gets cheaper and cheaper to stamp out these heliostats, these big mirrors. They're getting better at designing the power block and so on. This kit is getting cheaper, and the cost of these are falling very, very rapidly. We announced Energy 2029 in February. We've already had to revise down the cost of the, of the solar thermal component uh, I think by 25%, I need Chantelle up here, by a lot, by an extreme amount, because of the power purchase agreement that these guys, Solar Reserve, were able to sign with the utilities in Nevada. Um, they want to set up an office here in Perth. They are very, very edgy about the outcome on the 7th of September, because Mr Rabbit, I won't put his face up this time, has already said uh, there'll be no renewable energy under a government I lead either. Like, that kind of stuff's not going to get built. If they pull apart the Clean Energy Act, we can kiss it goodbye. We built a, an investment company, an investment arm of the Commonwealth Government, expert at risk to, to help finance and get these plants built. That's what it's for. $2 billion a year for the next five years. 
plus more than $3 billion a year in ARENA, which is about uh, the research and development. So they're not offering loans, they're offering grants to get things built. That's how we are building the renewable economy. That's how that, which is on the other side of the world, is going to occur uh, not too far from Coolgardie, sometime in the next term of government, if we have anything to do with it. But we are in real trouble if we lose the numbers in the Senate and aren't able to prevent the repeal of the Clean Energy Act, it's gone. We will lose a decade, and it's a decade we cannot afford to lose. So here's what it looked like. You start with the black power network that we have at the moment. Big coal generators in the Collie Basin, gas generators and coal, a bit of coal on the Swan Coastal Plain. And this is what it would look like. These big circles, these disks, are capacities. Imagine if you turn everything up to 100 at the same time, which you wouldn't do because you would blow it up. But if you did, it would look like that. So the two scenarios that Sen built for us, here's the first one. Solar heavy, so these are these big solar concentrator plants out in the sun belt. Wind in the wind belt, wave on the coast, biomass, a little bit of biomass in the middle, particularly in Collie, PV. That's how you provide, it's quite heavily overbuilt, but that's how you provide, in one particular formulation, uh, an energy grid that can run 24-7, summer and winter, on sun, wind, wave, a little bit of geothermal. It actually can be done. It can be done by the year 2029, and we had better get cracking. Scenario two is a bit more diverse and a bit cheaper, a bit more biomass, different mix in Collie. And the reason that we asked them to provide a couple was that there's no particular way to 100% renewable energy. Somebody invents a cheap, disposable, recyclable, deep cycle battery, small enough to stick in your carport, which is happening, then you wouldn't need some of the infrastructure on this map. And quite frankly, I couldn't care less. The sooner that happens, the better. It won't look exactly like this, but it's gonna look like something. But we're in a hurry. And what's sadly lacking in the political sphere at the moment is any sense of urgency, yeah, that we are on the deck of the ship, we've seen this dirty great iceberg come looming out of the fog, and the guy who appears to be about to grab the wheel is saying we need to drive the thing faster. Uncomfortable metaphor. Here's what <laughs> these things look like. This is one that we designed. Here's one we prepared earlier, a three-cell solar concentrator plant somewhere in the gold fields. And we've shopped this and took the company Solar Reserve out to Kalgoorlie. Uh, the mining industry, I think, nickel and copper producers will build the first one of these. I suspect maybe iron ore producers in the central Pilbara. Good for them, good on them. I want to help that happen because they'll make it cheaper for the rest of us. But you can see these things basically just tracking the sun and it looks as though the lights are going out, but of course they're not. I can't express enough how much of a game changer it is that the next time someone comes at you and says, what are you gonna do when the sun goes down? Um, it just... <laughs> That really came from the heart, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you'll be able to tell them what you're gonna do when the sun goes down or when the wind stops blowing is that you're gonna be able to keep doing what you're doing. The, the situation and the setup has changed, technology has changed. What I've described really is quite a jobs rich future when you think about it, of all the different things that we've already traversed. So the whole, who's heard the, Who's heard the, the meme that the Greens are a communist plot to deindustrialize the planet? Have you all <laughs> heard, heard that? I've heard that a bit. It's, it's funny until it stops being funny, actually. Um, for every million dollars that you spend in the coal industry, you get five jobs. And we better not forget those five jobs. We're going to Collie on Monday. I'm gonna give a similar, shorter version of the talk there. I don't feel comfortable marching around the state talking about the end of coal until we've actually spoken to the coal work workers and the people whose mortgages and their kids' future depends on that. If you're in the five, sorry, that's gas. Coal was seven, gas is even less. There are fully automated gas power stations in the north of this city where nobody works at all. Here's part of the, here's part of the picture. For the housing proposals, so for the initiatives that I just put up for you, for every million dollars you spend on the housing affordability work, eight jobs. Energy 2029, 12 to 16, depending on your assumptions. The green rental retrofit, that is labour intensive. You can imagine rolling energy and water retrofits across the building stock of the whole country. 17 jobs for every million bucks. Perth Light Rail 22, because that again is labour intensive to put that public transport infrastructure back in. But guess who won? Bikes. <laughs> 46, so let's get started. <laughs>